Following their first playoff appearance in a decade and a half, the Sacramento Kings definitely had a less than satisfactory season. While I don't know if they'll quite be able to separate themselves in the war zone that is the Western Conference, I definitely think they improved with the addition of DeMar DeRozan. Combine this with retaining Malik Monk and another year of development from the likes of Keegan Murray and Keon Ellis, and I think the Kings will be back in the mix in the Western Conference. Sacramento added a dynamic talent to a core with two all-star caliber players, and I think that is being vastly underrated. Today I'll be going over the Kings offseason, their roster, and what to expect from them this upcoming season. Let's start with the major addition in Sacramento, DeMar DeRozan. While the lack of interest around the league was somewhat understandable due to his age and play style that doesn't fit many teams, I still think this move improves the Kings. DeMar is still a quality talent and I believe he will elevate this Kings team. With floor spacers such as Keegan Murray and the vastly improved 3 point shooting of De'Aaron Fox, I don't think this fit will be as awkward as it may seem to some. DeMar's ability to attack closeouts and his playmaking ability will help mitigate his lack of 3 point shooting making the perceived spacing issue not as bad as it may seem on face value. Also, when you consider how little it costs to get DeMar, just below $77 million over three years in the current NBA economy, as well as De'Aaron Fox declining to negotiate an extension to see how the team's roster takes shape, this move makes even more sense. This was the best talent the Kings realistically could have landed, and they got him at next to nothing. Your number one priority at the moment has to be getting pen to paper on a De'Aaron Fox extension, and while I don't know if this makes that a complete certainty, it definitely helps your chances. This is also really only a two-year commitment, with the third year of the required three-year deal for a sign-in trade being mostly non-guaranteed. This is an extremely low-risk, decent-reward move, and given the Kings' situation and the talent around the league, I like it. I will say though, giving up the 2031 pick swap, and again, it's 2031, who knows what happens between now and then. I, I you know, I talked about this in my Spurs video because I think that was a good get for the Spurs. You know, they get Harrison Barnes in a swap down the line for nothing. That could come back to bite you, but you know, that's, you know, seven years away, man. So I, you know, you can't really say for sure. Yeah, I can say I like the Spurs getting in on that and getting Barnes in, a, in that swap for nothing, but you know, I, I don't, you know, I, it was still very uh, low cost for the Kings. While he is expected to miss the start of the regular season, the acquisition of Devin Carter is also a great one. The at times projected top 10 pick fell to 13 and is expected to be a great connector and role player. Also with his college experience, he will be a contributor now and later, adding to the already elite guard play of Fox, Monk, and Ellis. Carter averaged nearly 9 rebounds a game as a 6'3 guard to go along with his 20 points and 3.5 and assists a night in his third year in school. He also showed vast improvement in his three-point shooting in both percentage and volume. Over his first two years in school, he shot a measly 28.2% from deep on 2.8 attempts a game. This past season, he shot 37.7% on 6.8 attempts a game. More than doubling your previous volume while increasing your percentage by nearly 10% is unheard of and is a testament to Carter's work ethic. He knew what he had to do to make himself wanted in the NBA as a smaller guard and got to work. He also raised his overall efficiency from 52.3% shooting over his freshman and sophomore years to nearly 60% in 2023 24. This draft was not one to look for someone to transform your franchise, but was one to look for a potentially great piece, and I think with Devin Carter's skill set, he could be just that. The other major part of Sacramento's offseason was Malik Monk's free agency. I, and many, were under the impression that Monk would be offered a more lucrative contract than the Kings could offer elsewhere and would leave. Instead, Monk stayed home accepting a four-year, $78 million deal, leaving potentially tens of millions on the table should offers have been what many expected. Could they have not been and that played a part in him remaining in Sacramento? Maybe, but I can almost guarantee there was a more lucrative offer out there. How much more lucrative exactly is the question. Regardless of the reasons, the Kings got to retain a dynamic talent in De'Aaron Fox's Kentucky brother on a very team-friendly deal. Now that we've gone over the Kings offseason in full, let's talk about the rest of this roster from the top down. Starting off with your franchise cornerstone, De'Aaron Fox. The one aspect of De'Aaron Fox's game that was questionable was his shooting from deep, and he made big strides there this past season. I actually made a video about this during the season, so if you want to hear about that specifically in more depth, be sure to check that out. Here I'll say that Fox shot 32.1% from deep on 3.8 attempts a night through his first six seasons. This past season, Fox shot nearly 37% from deep on almost eight attempts a night. His improved jump shooting will help him a great deal in the postseason, especially with the inevitably somewhat worse spacing with DeMar being inserted. Fox is capable of playing at an all-NBA level and should be entering his prime at 26 years old. Your other cornerstone is DeMontis Sabonis, and while I am very pro rim protecting big, he is an extremely impactful player. Last season, he averaged 19, 14, and 8 on nearly 64% true shooting. While he is far from a stretch big, he, like Fox, 
has made himself more respectable from there as of late. While he only shoots about a three a game, over his past two years in Sacramento, he has shot it at 37.6%, compared to just shy of 32% on around one and a half attempts a game over his first six years as a pro. While he is capable of getting you in and around 20 a night, it's the playmaking of Sabonis that really separates him offensively. He averaged 5.6 assists to 3.1 turnovers a night from his first season getting heavy minutes and his first All-Star season in 1920 through the 21-22 campaign. Over the past two full years in Sacktown, Domas has taken it up to 7.7 .7 assists a game, including 8.2 this past season, while maintaining 3.1 turnovers a night. Combine this with his back-to-back -back rebounding titles and you have an extremely impactful player. Sabonis received an all-NBA third team nod but wasn't an all-star, an interesting situation that we've seen from the likes of Damian Lillard in 15-16, where he ended up making all-NBA second team somehow. To close, yes, Domas has one of the most impactful flaws in the game of basketball, but he also brings a lot to the table to try and make up for that. Your next most important piece that's been here is Keegan Murray, and while he didn't have a bad season per se, it definitely wasn't all you hoped it would be. He did increase his points per game by three, but at the cost of his three-point percentage falling from just over 41% to slightly below 36%, and his overall efficiency going from 59.7% true shooting as a rookie to a hair below 57%. I don't think this is all that much a cause for concern, as Keegan should be able to bounce back here with another playmaker and DeMar DeRozan to get him the ball, but this definitely wasn't the most encouraging season from Keegan. What could be alarming is that Keegan is 24 years old, only about two and a half years younger than De'Aaron Fox who was drafted five years before him. But again, I personally am not all that worried and think that despite of a sophomore slump, Keegan will be able to bounce back in a role more similar to the one that he had during his rookie campaign. Last thing, although it is an extremely small sample of two games, Keegan did play great during the play-in tournament. The next player I want to discuss is Keon Ellis, who after receiving inconsistent minutes, about 11 and a half a night through his first 34 games, which spanned the 58 game of the season due to many DMPs, was a revelation late in the year. He started 18 of the remaining 23 games he would play, with his minutes more than doubling to 25.7 a night. Keon not only got the opportunity, but seized it. Over this stretch, he averaged 8.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 2 assists while shooting over 49% from the field and nearly 46% from deep while averaging less than a turnover a game, plus being a pest on the defensive end. Keon, like hopefully Devin Carter, is a great connective piece and not like Devin Carter was a diamond in the rough for the Kings as he went undrafted in 2022. On top of all this, the Kings have him locked down for the next two seasons at no more than $2.3 million, and this is huge in the era of the aprons. Keon Ellis was a great get on all accounts for the Kings, and is a piece of the stack Kings guard play including Fox, Monk, and eventually Devin Carter. Your last two pieces of real importance are Kevin Herter and Trey Lyles, and they both provide arguably the most valuable skill for role players in the modern NBA. I still see Kevin Herter in my nightmares as a Sixers fan, but he did suffer a pretty significant dip this season in comparison to last. In 22-23, Herter averaged over 15 a night, including over 40% from deep on nearly 7 attempts a night. This past season, he averaged exactly 5 less points while shooting below 38% from deep for just the second time in his career, at 36.1% on 1.5 attempts a game less than his 40.2% the season prior. After his most efficient season overall by a long shot last year at 61.7% true shooting, Herter fell all the way down to 56.4%. Not by any means do I think it's over for Herter, However, him replicating both the volume and efficiency of his 22-23 campaign are highly unlikely with the addition of DeMar DeRozan. But the thing is, this is mostly unattainable because you don't need all that from him. If Herder can get his stroke back, he can be highly effective as a movement shooter and an important piece to a modern NBA offense. If he can even get back to his 38% from deep and 10-12 to 12 points a game he gave during his first four years prior to the 23 campaign, I'd say it's a win. The last player who will get a decent chunk of minutes is Trey Lyles, and I think he too can be a quality piece. His serviceable defense and basically 38.5% from deep on nearly 4 attempts a game are valuable. He won't make or break your season, but he can definitely be an impactful piece for you if you're the Kings. He is one of but a handful of non-negative defenders on this roster, and that can have a large impact given the defensive woes of most of the roster. The Kings also re-signed backup big Alex Len, signed Jordan McLaughlin, and signed young big Orlando Robinson. I doubt Jordan McLaughlin sees the court much unless there are injuries, and while the backup big situation could be better, Alex Len didn't even see 10 minutes a night last season. To wrap this up, I think the Kings have done a nice job given their options, but as we all know with the Kings winning 46 games and ending up the 9 seed, the West is a bloodbath. I can't say I can put this team up there with OKC, Denver, Dallas, Minnesota, and Memphis, but I do think they will be in the mix. With Memphis coming back, you only have, barring injury, 
three playoff spots between the Clippers, Lakers, Warriors, Suns, Pelicans, and Kings. I could argue all six of these teams are playoff caliber, while only half will make the playoffs and one won't even see the play-in. While I can't put them in the second tier of the West I just named, you also have Houston and San Antonio who could very well become 40-win teams. Injuries will happen and that could change things, but even if one of those six teams get essentially taken out, two are still missing out on the playoffs completely. I think the Kings are a more than playoff caliber team, but with the amount of talent in the Western Conference and really the league as a whole, it's becoming increasingly harder to separate yourself. What comes of it I'm not sure, but what I do know is that this will be another winning season in Sacramento with a group of talent that's going to be a whole lot of fun to watch. That's going to wrap this one up. If you enjoyed it, please like it up, sub the channel, hit that noti bell. That would help me out a ton. We are on the road to 5k. Comment down below, you know, what do you think the ceiling for this Kings team is? How good do you think they are? Again, man, I think, you know, I think it's a good team. I think there are years where this team could win a playoff series, but just with the way the West is now, like again, man, there's only going to be three playoff spots between the Clippers, Lakers, Warriors, Suns, Pelicans, the Kings. And I think you can argue that all six of those teams are could make the playoffs in some years and maybe even win a playoff series in some years so again man the, the west is just insane uh yeah it, it's gonna be tough but hey man I, I think this team will be a lot of fun to watch with you know the talent of fox and damar and sabonis and then you, you got the shooters around them i think this team will be a really fun watch and that's gonna wrap this one up for good once again if y'all could like the video sub the channel would help me out a ton and that's gonna wrap this one up peace